worst monster that you can find. If you want to look for the worst monster, just look in the mirror. Everybody in the world is scared of the same things. Everybody in Germany is scared of the same things that we're scared of in the United States. Exactly the same. Death, loss of a loved one being disfigured, loss of identity. I mean, you go down the whole list of things. We're, we're, all, we're all humans. We're all scared. So um, talk about a universal subject. That's what uh, horror and monsters is all about. Sometimes it's, it's almost, it's a question of the way you tell the story that makes a monster a monster. Um, you can tell the story of Beauty and the Beast and make the beast a monster, or you can tell the story and make him a tragic hero. King Kong certainly at the time was, was groundbreaking because no one had ever seen anything like that before. The irony, of course, was Kong was probably 22 inches tall and was created via a technique called stop-motion animation, which sadly is barely used anymore. But what that means is you would build an armature, a jointed armature, and in each joint you would be able to reposition and photograph and then reposition again and photograph it again one single frame at a time. So when you play that film at 24 frames per second, you would actually see this thing moving. Well, there were giant monsters before then, but this was the first time they actually managed to, to create a character that you felt something about. And Kong was, was a pretty neat character. When you're a kid, uh, you watch King Kong because he's, he's the he, you identify with him. I mean, he's the hero of the picture. And when he has his fight with the Tyrannosaurus, uh, which still is an unsurpassed bit of staging, I think, uh, in a monster movie, uh, you, the audience sympathy goes completely to him. And so at the end of the picture, when he's victimized by bring, coming to uh, civilization, as has happened to so many of us, um, he, uh, you know, your heart really goes out to him. And, and um, I think it, it's a measure of his popularity that these huge remakes have been, you know, every, every generation they make another huge remake, and it's always made by people who, you know, were captivated, um, usually when young, by the original King Kong. <laughs> As King Kong was kind of thrilling and amazing to audiences in the 30s, Godzilla was the same thing when he came out. Guess which country was the one upon which two atomic bombs were dropped? Japan. Guess what it looks like when Godzilla destroys Tokyo? A whole lot like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So one doesn't have to go very far to see that this was a Japanese version of probably Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, but also it was a stand-in for the bomb and the dangers of it and what can it, it can do. つまり、
、えー、全世界に向けて比較声明を出したというつまり、えー、っとゴジラっていうのは核の申し子っていうことでね、えーえー、なんて言うんだろう戦争反対の意味も込めて絶対に核爆弾の使用は相にならないぞという怒り気持ちを込めてゴジラを作ったわけですね。で我々が小さい時からもうこの何て言いますかね恐竜のもう先端を行くものとしてずっと小さい時からこれ育ってきたんですよだから日本の誇りですね我々、ね、世代が。はもう一応動物ということになってるんだけども核怪獣であの体全体がねその核ミサ,あのミサイルも通さないこのものすごく頑丈にできてるわけですよだからあのね軍隊がねいくら攻撃してもね跳ね返すわけそれが、えー、日本のゴジラなゴジラ像なんだから何とか自分として中に入っててるとだんだんだんだんね愛おしくなってくるんだよねだんだんだんだんで今も特にねゴジラあすごい終わってから感じるんだよねゴジラってすごいないまだにザーッと引っ張ってるという感じでねうんだから自分にとってゴジラはやっぱりえー、なんというかな元気になった元というかなあああうっくんの残らないあやりがいのある役だったな。平和の時代が長く続くと。いつの間にかね。その。唯一の被爆国であった日本人の頭の中からこの核問題はもう消えちゃってるんですね平和のぬるま湯に使ってるようなことになってきちゃったからもう特にあの今の若い人それから子供たちにこの辺の怖さを訴えてもそれは一体何を言ってるんだとつまり理解してもらえない状態になってきたんですねそこでね、えー、ゴジラを今後どうしようかという話になった時ですねじゃあこの際一旦子供向けのアイドルにしようゴジラ助けてゴジラやっぱり小さい子は町を壊したりとかする怖い生き物だけどなんだろうやっぱりゴジラとかはあのー、たまに救ってくれたりする怪物でもあるからいい生き物でもあるっていう怪物だと思います
Japan has a tradition of being at the mercy of nature, earthquakes and typhoons and things have been happening to them for a long time that they really have had no control over. If a monster appears in a movie, uh, the American attitude would be, we must do something about this. Whereas the Japanese attitude is simply, we must somehow survive this. G-Fest is a gathering of Godzilla enthusiasts. Uh, I publish a magazine called G-Fan and I have contributors from all over the country, in fact around the world, and one year we decided it would be nice to get together and to meet each other, see each other face to face, and we had such a good time we decided to try to organize a convention. And lo and behold, 15 years later we have about 1,500 people showing up each year to our summer G-Fest. Now we're in the dealer's room at G-Fest. Uh, people bring their merchandise uh, from all over the country. Dealers that usually do mail order business uh, set up tables and display their goods. And as soon as the door is open, the fans are going to come in because they're looking for that one or two collectibles that they have been trying to find for a long time. Money is almost no object. Uh, some people will pay uh, crazy prices for something that they need to fill in their collection, but it's a moment of great excitement. Uh, it's almost, uh, for some people, like the hunt for the holy grail because they want to get those pieces for their collections. here we are. This feels like home. It's been a while and I haven't had uh, had this on in about three years, but uh, it still fits and that's good news. You go out at G-Fest in your costume and everybody um, enjoys it. I think it's something that we all like but in many places we don't talk about it and here's the one place where we can run up and down the hall screaming i love godzilla and you can stand up in the main hall and do your imitations of the monster's cries and nobody is going to laugh at you when i pack up for the show to bring my suits i back my van up to the garage door and i open the door up and i don't bring my suits out into the driveway where people can see what i'm doing because i really don't want to be the guy who lives on the corner who has uh, rubber monsters in his basement People at G-Fest love these old-fashioned monster movies because I think there's a lot of nostalgia tied in. Many of the people are my age, and they grew up watching these movies as kids, and for some reason the attachment stuck with them. But I think more than that, there's a lot of imagination, a lot of craftsmanship in these movies. I think that the people who enjoy them have a, a love for fantasy and the ability to suspend their disbelief so they can enjoy them for what they are and they don't have to have a photorealistic kind of a scene going on in front of them for them to be able to enjoy them. I actually think that's a gift. And I think probably most of the people here feel sorry for people who can't enjoy movies with Japanese monsters and Godzilla in them. The first time I saw Alien, I had no idea what the creature looked like. All I knew was that it was, that it had two mouths, and it drooled a lot, and it had these hor horrendous silver teeth. But you really don't ever get a really clear idea of what it looks like. So all you're seeing is these weird, irregular shapes, and you have no idea what you're looking at. It becomes something that your brain can't instantly recognize. And by not being able to rationalize 
intellectually what it is, it becomes more terrifying. ins Kino gingen und das Licht löschten. Ich durfte keinen so, heute haben die Kinder so Licht, damit sie nicht ähm, Angst haben, ja. Aber dieses wurde mir nicht gewährt, dazu mal. gegeben, das Alien schön zu machen, weil ich liebe ästhetische Sachen, also etwas, das sich durch den Brustkorb frisst, auch wenn das ästhetisch ausschaut, ist das immer noch ziemlich eine üble Sache und das darf ja ruhig so ausschauen, wie es ist, es ist eine Art Wurm, also etwas, das einen im Körper sich bewegt, das erinnert an Eingeweide und, oder eben ein Wurm in den Eingeweiden, das darf ruhig schrecklich sein. Hingegen das heranwachsende Monster, das ist dann wiederum ästhetisch, das wollte ich ästhetisch, die Zähne und der ganze Kopf und alles. Also, ja, also jemand, der sagt, das wäre widerlich oder so, das ist vielleicht, wie es sich bewegt, oder sind, also die Gefährlichkeit, aber an und für sich als... als Skulptur oder so finde ich schön. design it and not a creature effects shop I think was a stroke of genius because there are times when we tend to be locked into the human form you know we know that okay the guy the creature's head has to be here and the arms are here and the legs are here and what Giger was able to do was distract your eye away from the human body form Das Alienmonster da hinter mir, das ist vor 30 Jahren, habe ich das modelliert und es sieht jetzt aus wie, wie eine Mumie, so richtig verschrumpelt. Aber das ist das Originalkostüm, das in, in Rapper gegossen wurde nicht? und, und äh, äh, hat sich natürlich sehr verändert. Da ist der, der, die doppelten Zähne da, da hat es eine Zunge, die bezahnt ist, das kann so rausschießen und dann jemand packen. <lacht> We have this odd, odd relationship with technology. 
We love it, look what it gives us. We hate it, look what it's doing to us.あの、子供の時はやっぱりあの、そこまで今こう、紙くだいって考えてないんで、子供の時はやっぱりあの、夜夢見とっかけてくるのは日本の典型的なあの、こう、黒い髪の長いあの、白白装束というか、白い服を着
she doesn't see anything wrong with creating a monster. What's wrong with Frankenstein is then he immediately rejects it. He doesn't bring it up properly. A creature created by an uncaring creator, which is what a lot of people feel about God. And uh, I, I think it's got a, a resonance that uh, is one of the reasons that it's, it's been so popular over the years. <laughs> ま、一面的な見方ですけど、なんかある程度ルールがあって、あの、どこでも何でも何かわけわかんなく出てきちゃうってことはなくて、フランケンシュタインでもでもちゃんとやっぱり物体としての体ありますから、あの、ドアをち
the real human monster, something like I don't know, Hannibal Lecter or a Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, are much more internal. They're much more you know, credible, realistic ones. But the ones with masks, you know, the, the Jason or the Michael, they aren't realistic characters at all. I mean, they're in fact more fantastical than the average vampire or, or werewolf. <laughs> Like um, Leatherface and like Michael Myers uh, from the Halloween films, you know those those characters are uh, characters that are still threatening, but are ones that you could potentially see right see down the street. You could potentially be at a market and be shopping next to a guy who is a killer, um, especially. But I, I think all those are based on on the real dark nature of humanity. The trend for serial killer movies in the 80s was partly because we had lost faith in, in real monsters, as it were, in Dracula and Frankenstein. We had to move on from that. We had to find something. I think the, the mere fact that the term serial killer was invented, yeah. Uh, I mean, the phenomenon's been around since Jack the Ripper. <laughs> In the 80s, in the, in the kind of psycho killer, uh, you know, the more reality-based kind of monsters, which in many ways I think is scarier in the fact that this is a real thing. People do kill people. There are psycho killers. So it's not the kind of monster movie I enjoy, though. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a real splatter movie fan, you know, and I don't really think it's necessarily healthy to, to become so habituated to that kind of stuff. He's like my alter ego and uh, my ad adopted son. Like Junior on the on the outside is like what I feel like on the, on the inside. You know, I feel deformed inside. And on uh, the outside of Junior, he shows it all. The monster is uh, now showing his deformity. To deny the, the, the darkest side of humanity would be to deny like uh, any positive side either. I mean, they're all, it's the, they wouldn't exist without the other. When you could identify with the monster, even like showing the most horrible atrocity that the monster commits, and you still empathize, and you still can have some feeling for the monster, I mean, to me, that's the most effective monsters. know uh, the story of Ed Gein, but only through uh, the films that have been loosely based on his life. Ed Gein, um, he was um, dominated by his mother to such an ex extreme degree that deformed his psyche. After his, his mother had died, and he's an adult living alone, and he really had no friends. People like laughed at him and, you know, made fun of him. And so here he was isolated with um, the only most important thing in his life. His mother disappears and now he's all alone in the house and he boards up her her room and keeps it immaculate exactly the way she she had it. And then he goes into this almost uh, like a journey of ex exploration into the darkest you know uh, sides of his own soul he uh, starts out by going to uh, the Plainfield Cemetery 
uh, where his mother was buried, and he would look at the obituary ads, and, and if he saw a woman, you know, had been buried recently, he would go to the cemetery and dig up that woman and drag her home. And he would start making um, furniture, clothing, and totems, you know, out of these body parts. The fact that they weren't fresh enough, uh, he decided that he needed live women. Uh, Ed Gein also was uh, honest. Like, I remember um, this one anecdote in which um, Mary Hogan, uh, one of his victims that, you know, that he had taken alive, um, everyone was wondering where this woman was because she had disappeared. And so there was a bunch of people, like, hanging out talking about the story, and, uh, and so they called him Eddie, not Ed. And so Eddie... Um, said, I know where Mary Hogan is. She's hanging out at my place. And she was literally hanging upside down, deer style, because he would drain the body of its blood by hanging it upside down into a bucket, and it had no head. So he told them where, where she was. There's something about that innocence, you know, that's fascinating. I think as long as you keep um, looking at the monster as the enemy, um, you're going to be doomed to be the, the victim of it. When you realize that the monster is yourself, then you can learn something from it. You know, in fact, you know, if there is, you know, a god or there is um, some order in the universe, it's been preordained that they are a necessary part of, of humanity. Otherwise, they would not exist. So it's better to learn than, than to just dismiss. films, but I like the more old-school horror films where you have a, a monster that isn't necessarily evil, you know, but because of its looks, you know, it it's all forced into doing things, harm to people or something, that, And but you, they're, they're actually sympathetic, you know. I mean, Frankenstein's monster is sympathetic, you know. The Hunchback of Notre Dame is a really sympathetic character, so is the Wolfman. The werewolf um, keeps coming back. I mean, it's actually the oldest of these stories. I think if you go back in, you know, all the others you're, are traceable basically back to 19th century novels. The werewolf goes back much, much deeper. There isn't a great werewolf novel that they're all based on. It is, you know, folk tales and legends. Uh, and it, there is just something appealing about the, an explanation of why people turn awful. kids love werewolves and boys particularly is because uh, it's all about puberty and uh, you know all of a sudden you've got this hair and you don't know where it comes from and uh, you have these urges and you don't know where they come from the werewolves didn't really hit it off very much until like the mid 30s and and then uh, you know when Universal made the Wolfman uh, it became very iconic because uh, you know everybody felt sorry for him because he was had this terrible problem and um, it, the, the world genre has had its ups and downs. I mean, it comes along, and then it goes away, and then it comes back. And, and the year that The Howling came out, uh, five other werewolf pictures came out. It was, and there had been a real drought of werewolf pictures before that. Uh, it's just one of those things where society is, you know, where the zeitgeist is, is, is that's the idea. <laughs>
still, I think, a real magic that happens when you have an actor in the makeup, and and it's there on the set, and and you know he sees him, he looks in, at himself in the mirror, and he sees this Wolfman looking back at him. You know, uh, it's and you know the whole Wolfman story is this whole story of this man who's you know changing into this animal, and it's not really he's tortured by this, you know, and and. Uh, and when you've got the makeup on, you're are kind of tortured by being being that animal man. Well, my favorite monster is Dracula. Um, partly because it was the first one for me. It was the first monster movie I saw was the Bela Lugosi Dracula film. Um, it's something I've returned to over and over throughout my career as a critic and a, a fiction writer. Um, something, what appeals to me about Dracula in particular as a monster is that he is undeniably awful. He is a terrible, terrible creature. He does awful, dreadful things, but you can have a conversation with him. He's also the one who seems to me to operate on the biggest scale, even bigger than, than Godzilla, you know, who destroys the city. It, you know, because Dracula basically wants to take over the world, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a line in the, the novel about him, you know, wanting cre to create a new breed of of humanity who pass through death rather than life. And that's kind of thinking big, isn't it? It's more than, uh, you know, the Frankenstein monster just wants a friend and the werewolf just wants a meal. And Mr. Hyde basically just wants to get laid. You know, yeah, Dracula wants to change the world for the worse. <laughs> advent of computer technology, it would be very easy to take a, a technique like creature costume building and substitute it for computer graphics. And I still love building creature suits and the idea of physically being on set and seeing it transform in front of your eyes to first it's a guy, then it's a guy wearing a part of a costume and then they light it and then it becomes moody and you put a little bit of slime on it and you spritz it with a little bit of water and it all, all of a sudden does not become a guy wearing a costume anymore. Then it becomes that character. And then the actor's performance brings it to life, sometimes the puppeteers do. It really is exciting. Anytime you're on a movie set and a guy comes in wearing a big monster suit or you bring a really cool puppet, you know, people always respond and they always like the fact that they can actually physically go up and touch something and they see it there. It's not just reacting to an empty frame and then they're going to put it in later. This character right here, this was a quarter scale animatronic puppet for a John Carpenter film called In the Mouth of Madness. This is uh, Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning. Uh, this is all silicone skin. First it's sculpted and then run in silicone, which has a very fleshy, lifelike appearance. And then if you notice all the hairs, these are all punched in one at a time and then trimmed and styled. Same with the mustache and then even the facial hair on the chin. So this is all punched in to make it look as realistic as possible. Over here we have some different design maquettes and characters from a horror movie called 13 Ghosts. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll start with sketches and designs and then go right into three-dimensional maquettes that are character studies so that then we can translate those to full-size prosthetics that actors would wear. Down here we have a various assortment of characters. This is the butcher from Land of the Dead, zombie movie that we did with George Romero. So we really wanted to play up the idea that these makeups not only had contact lenses to make their eyes appear clouded and dead, but they also had custom dentures. And we really wanted to accentuate the fact that the nose was starting to rot off. So there's a lot of little decomposition and rot in these characters to make them look like uh, that they're decomposing. This is a articulated werewolf head that we did. This has full range of movement, the mouth opens and closes, the lips move, the eyes move, the eyes blink, the ears move. So, we do a little bit of everything here.
でも結局今は怪獣がなくなってしまってやっぱいわゆる日本の怪獣が育ってきたおっさんたちが嫌だなと思ってるのは結局その怪獣のやっぱ魅力本体の魅力ぬいぐるみの魅力ですよねこれ生きてるんだぞというその怪獣のぬいぐるみの魅力それをまあヒーチャーっていうかねうんスポット当てて結局その昔の怪獣界の作り方をやはりもう一回踏襲してやる,やるしかないんじゃないかと思ってるんですよ。さんストップしてくださいまああのパロディの要素もいっぱい入ってるんですけど基本的には真面目な怪獣映画ですで要するにでもよかったら怪獣映画ってねあのみんなホラーっていうかその大真面目に捉えてる人もいっぱいいますけども基本的にはお笑いだと思うんですよねなぜかというとその怪獣映画があんなもんいるわけないのにあのみんなパニックになると。どうかに笑いだと私は捉えてるんだよね。ゲレナイズ、ナーセン。では自分自身はですね、えー、唯一誇りにしているのは、えー、この道30年近くやってますけども。いまだ,未だに、えー、スーツをかぶって、えー、倒れたことがないというのが唯一誇りですしかし、えー、倒れそうになったことはもう何度もありまして、えー、一番危ないと思ったことはですね自分自身の自律神経が完全に壊れてしまいまして体温調節機能が全く効かなくなったということがありますこの映画を見ていただ,いただければわかると思いますがあの実際事実上ですねその北朝鮮の脅威というものもあのしっかりと描いております。でえー、さらに北朝鮮が持っているであろうという核の恐怖ですねそれもしっかりと描いておりますので、えー、私個人の考えもそれに、えー、共賛するものであって、えー、やはり今回の作品においては、えー、ギララという宇宙からの怪獣をやっつけるという名目において、えー、北朝鮮が核を使用すると。いうそういう恐怖感ですね。And there was a prohibition on showing anything like buildings coming down. It was exactly the opposite reaction. It wasn't filmmakers rushing to make a movie about the buildings coming down because that was thought to, it was such a blow to America. George Romero's Land of the Dead, which we did the effects on, the original script, there's people escaping from an area called Fiddler's Green, which is、uh, a Area that's been cordoned off from all the zombies where all the human beings are living. And at the very end of the script, a bunch of people climb into a helicopter as the zombies are invading the building. And a bunch of zombies get up onto the roof, and one of them grabs and gets its way into the helicopter as it's taking off. And the helicopter actually spins out of control and crashes into the building. And there's a big giant explosion. So after 9 11, The script was rewritten and that whole gag was taken out. I couldn't criticize the president. You couldn't say anything. You had to be patriotic. If you weren't patriotic, you were a terrorist. It, it was an unbelievable time over here. It was unbelievable. <laughs> w h a 
what was born out of 9-11 is the torture movies. And that was born because, well, guess why? They were, it came about after Abu Ghraib. And look at the torture movies like uh, oh, no, Hostel and then those kind of films. Even Saw a little bit. But Hostel especially, I just give you the plot of, of American kids go to a foreign country and guess what happens to these stupid Americans? Well, where do you think that all came from? It came right out of our actions uh, after 9-11. So you see, the filmmakers are at work. They're just not at work in ways you might expect. thing in the world could be happening to you or or this horrible uh state of affairs in our country but people still want to forget about it monsters in movies because there are many monsters in the world right now, the real world. Some of those monsters may not be real, but I think people have a lot of fears uh, nowadays about uh, dangers that could be real or might even be very remote, but they've been convinced by the media that they are closer than they may be. Uh, if I'm talking about fears of terrorism or ecological damage or things like this, global warming perhaps. And I think that uh, there's a feeling that we don't have much control over these kinds of fears. Danger of an epidemic spread remains. We've just bought ourselves some time. I think a lot of times what people don't know how to handle is the bad, horrific, horrible things that happen to them. So it's, it's always convenient to translate that to something else, to someone else. And I think with monsters and creatures, it gives you an opportunity to cleanse yourself of, of all of these weird feelings and, and sort of manifest them into something else physical. <laughs> the number one unknown in the world is what death is like so when you're when you're faced with the possibility of your impending doom at the hands of some horrible creature it's it's certainly a, a captivating uh, aspect and it's a it's it's a thrilling idea horror movies in particular have always had a sort of subversive edge to them and uh, a message that sneaks by usually on the guise of entertainment and um, I don't think that's going to change, and, and uh, these films are popular because young people like them, and so that's uh, their, what was once derided as a really, you know, crummy genre when I was a kid is now, uh, you know, a grade A mainstream, you know, big bucks genre. I mean, you don't, you've got movies like Hellboy, which, you know, in the 1950s, that would have been a, uh, a B picture. are about death. Monsters bring death usually. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a roller coaster ride. It's the way it's a way of being scared safely, dealing with our fears 
um, of whatever it is that we're afraid of. And, and when, you, when, you, when you roll them all together into a, a figure um, with a scary face, um, you know, it's, it's cathartic. And uh, obviously always has been long before movies. <laughs> the world's going we're gonna have to start looking at the idea of yeah monsters as endangered species yeah i think um we should start seeing films about protecting and preserving monsters you know it, it, yeah with their habitats being wiped out by global warming or whatever mm -hmm.